Hello everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the second English speech contest, Racial Voices, which is one of the 150th anniversary projects at Racial University. I'm Kaori Kotani of the Center for International Exchange at Racial University. I will be the MC for today's event. I'm pleased to meet you all here today. Let me briefly go over today's schedule. First of all, the director of the Center for International Exchange, Kei Lee Dendo, will give an opening address, followed by an introduction of today's judges and our guest speaker. Next, Russian University Vice President, Professor Kazuki Suda, will deliver a video message. The contest will begin after his message is concluded. There will be a brief intermission after four speakers have finished. After all eight presentations are completed, there will be a 20 minute break followed by a special lecture given by our guest speaker. After the lecture, there will be a 25 minute break and then the judges will announce the result and the award ceremony will be held. Finally, Center Director Dendo will make closing comments. We plan to finish at about 5 p.m. And now, Center Director Dendo will give an opening address. Okay, good afternoon everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second We Show Voices speech contest. Unfortunately, due to the lingering effects of COVID-19, we're unable to have an audience this year. But we'll make a video recording available to those who are interested in viewing the contest. This event is a Rishou University 150th anniversary project, and we would like to thank the President's Office for providing the funding that enabled us to hold this contest. Now, this event is a contest. However, the true purpose is to provide a venue for students to make their voices heard, to express themselves, and develop confidence and skills that will serve them well throughout their lives. In other words, everyone who put in the time and effort to participate in this event walks away a winner. The staff of the Center for International Exchange have worked very hard to put together an entertaining program. So we hope you will enjoy listening to the speeches and our special guest speaker. This year, we had a total of 16 entries from six faculties, and eight of the 16 have advanced to the final round today. They have diligently put in many hours preparing for today's speech presentation which cover a wide variety of topics and issues. I'm sure you'll find a speech that moves and inspires you. So please, sit back and listen to the voices of Risho University. At this time, I would like to introduce our distinguished judges for today. First, we have Professor Takeshi Uno of Meiji University. Professor Uno has been a visiting professor at both Cambridge University and London University in England. And his fields of expertise include English societal and cultural studies. Thank you, Professor Uno. Next, we have Mr. Alexander Hunter. Mr. Hunter is a native of the state of Washington in the United States on the West Coast. He is working in Japan as an actor and model. His recent credits include the NHK educational program, Omotenashi no Kiso Eigo, from 2018 to 2020, as well as work in television dramas and movies. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Our third judge is Professor Eugenia Medrano. 
Professor Medrano holds a master's degree in English education from Temple University, Japan, and is the former director of continuing education at Temple University, Japan. She is still actively involved in teaching at Temple University, Japan, Lakeland University, Japan, and Soka University. Thank you, Professor Madron. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, the Reverend Keiji Oshima. After entering Sophia University, Reverend Oshima transferred to the Buddhist department at Risho University. Reverend Oshima is currently the manager of the international section, missionary division of the head office of Nichiren Shu. He has been actively involved in spreading the, teaching, the teachings of Nichiren Shu in Southeast Asia and Europe, as well as other parts of the world. I'm sure you'll find his presentation and perspective of language learning very enlightening. We are honored to have you here today. Thank you, Reverend Yoshima. Once again, thank you to all the judges and Reverend Oshima for taking the time to support our speech contest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, on behalf of the organizer, we have received a video message from Richard University Vice President in charge of the Center for International Exchange, Professor Kazuki Suga. Please direct your attention to the screen. Hello, my students. I want to ask you, how can we improve English speaking? How do you think? I think the best way is speaking English without shame. Our teacher told us to speak English in correct grammar and pronunciations. The difference of L and R sounds, the S with plurals, and use went in the past sense, G-O-E-D is wrong. Something like that. I think those makes us away from speaking English. But I often heard at Academic Congress, Italian scientist said, my presentation. A French student said, my presentation. Germany professor said, my presentation. Did it make any troubles? No, it's okay. We can communicate each other. And they have passions to present their study at the Congress. Grammatical correctness and fluent pronunciations do not make sense if we have passions to communicate with English speakers. Today, you make presentation in English. Your enthusiasm is good. Keep it forever. Take it easy. Enjoy today's contest. Bye-bye. We will now commence with the speeches. The first presenter is Maika Saito, the Faculty of Letters. Inexcusable. Hello everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that few of us ever consider, food loss and weight. Have you ever gone to get hungry? According to the Food Aid Foundation, one out of nine people are suffering from hunger in the world. Think of it. This is well over 800 million people. When you hear this statistic, you probably don't think Japan is included. In our affluent society, 
We don't often think about hunger, but did you know that tens of thousands of people, including children, go hungry in Japan every day? Yes, this is happening in our own backyard. According to the OECD, 15.6% of the Japanese population is suffering from hunger. We usually associate hunger with developing countries. However, this is also a serious problem in Japan. The hungry include many children. Lack of food affects their education and makes them vulnerable to illness. This is a heartbreaking situation, which is made sadder when we look at how much food is wasted in this country. Let's take a closer look at how much food goes to waste every day. A recent example of food loss and waste occurred during the Tokyo Olympics. It was announced that about 130,000 meals prepared for the Olympics were thrown away in the month of July. During the opening ceremonies alone, about 4,000 meals were thrown away. This is inexcusable. It is irresponsible and demonstrates a total lack of awareness by the organizers. The Olympics represent unity and peace. What a shame that such large scale waste happened at such an event. We can see food, food waste all around us. I used to work at a fast food shop and so large amounts of food when food thrown away every day. I estimate that over 10 kilograms of food are wasted every day in each store. Also, in convenience stores, it is said that 10 to 50 kilograms of food are wasted every day in each store. This accounts for about 3 to 5% of total food loss in Japan. I think addressing these issues begins with an awareness of the amount of food that is wasted every day. In Japan, it is said that we waste a bowl of food per person in a day. This translates to about 1.65 million tons of food wasted every year. On a global level, 1.3 billion tons of food are wasted every year. Today, I think many people tend to buy large amounts of food which they don't eat and immediately throw away. It is such a waste when there are people going hungry. Then, we must think about how to get this food to people who cannot get enough to eat. One of the good examples is happening like here in Shinagawa. It is called the Food Drive Project. Food collected by Shinagawa residents is donated to children who are suffering from hunger. If the residents also have food which they don't eat and are unopened, they can donate that food to the restaurant in Shinagawa. Unlike some Western and European countries, where food assistance activities are more common. Food drive programs are not familiar to most Japanese. So the first thing we need to do is, is to spread awareness of the need for such grassroots level activities. I think the power of social media can be harnessed more efficiently to get the message out. Then, needy children can receive those food from the restaurant. I think this is a great project. Another local example is the Kuromo restaurant in Kitashinagawa. This restaurant accepts donations and collect food from residents and provides low-cost meals to households with elementary, junior high, and high school students. When the residents want to donate, donate food, they can register to become a member of Food Drive Project. 
Children who cannot get enough to eat can come to this restaurant by collecting food before throwing it away. This project helps to reduce household food waste. I think food resources can be used more efficiently if projects like this are supported on a larger scale all over Japan. So, the next time you throw away any food, please recall my speech. People struggling to get enough to eat in our society is inexcusable. Let's work together to stop wasting food, so no one has to go to bed hungry. Thank you for your attention. The second presenter is Reiji Hotta, the Faculty of Letters. Business and Society Building Over the past few decades, the business world has become increasingly monopolized by cluster companies such as Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. Japan is no exception. Why do some companies prosper while others struggle to stay afloat? There are, broadly speaking, two major patterns among companies. While some companies base their practices on prioritizing their profits, others place equal or more value on working for the good of customers and society and base their policies on the principle. However, the gap between rich and poor has been seriously increasing in recent years and is the now the eighth largest among developed countries. Although ordinary profits have increased by 30% and dividends by 80%, salary paid to workers have decreased compared with 2012. Clearly, this discrepancy is one of the reasons why the gap has been widened. In addition, it is important to know how these companies make their profits. The Japanese industrialist and the father of Japanese capitalism, Eiichi Shibusawa, contributed to the building of our current capitalistic economy in the Meiji period. He was born into a Civil War Pan family and became a professional merchant in his youth. He, bought, he learned about economics by watching bank and stock systems. After he retired from the Ministry of Finance, he became a president of a bank and supported the growth of many companies. Even so, he was always conscious of his mother's words. It is more important for everyone to gain happiness than just one person gaining happiness. His attitude and ideas about true capitalism appear in his Moral Economic Unification Theory, which he presented it, sorry, which he presented in his later years. It explains that morality and economics should be equally important. It is true that our livelihood cannot be supported by morals alone. On the other hand, if we only care about money, then we will undermine our morality. I argue that the ideal economic practices in our society are those that are compatible with morality. It is my position that pursuing Shibusawa's idea can result in gains for punishment while being morally responsible, thus benefiting the economy and society as a whole. In the Meiji period, when democracy and capitalism started to take hold, businesses started with the purpose of enabling people to be freer and spend their life better than before. Recently, however, corporations in Japan have faced some moral dilemmas. Here is one example. Over the past few years, the People's Republic of China has been carrying out systematic detention and forced labor of users, and it was, it was found that 14 companies in Japan have linked to it. 
Some of the companies involved, such as Uniqlo, Sony, and Panasonic, are huge corporations that are well known not only in Japan but also all over the world. When the Japan Uyghur Association sent them a question asking them to investigate the truth of human rights violation, some of their answers seem to lack morality and ethics which was extremely unfortunate. If the things that you are buying without a thought are made through summer sacrifice, can you truly be satisfied? And make no mistake, if we use a smartphone or wear popular casual brands, we are a part of the problem. There are many similar global issues related to discrimination, child labor, and slavery. What can we, as consumers, do at the grassroots level? We have to pay attention to a company's morals and ethics when we make purchases. We must ask ourselves if exploitation and human rights violations were involved in the manufacture of products and make conscious informed decisions. In recent political news, the Kishida cabinet established its manifesto to realize an economy based on a new form of capitalism to narrow the division between rich and poor and realize a virtual cycle of growth and distribution. I think we, as citizens, should take this opportunity to encourage the government to not only aim at the regulatory and the structural reform but also are incorporating ethical and moral considerations. In this way, we can work toward a truly new form of capitalism. It is our generation that will be the driving the economy in coming years. Therefore, it is vital to consider how we can develop our society so that all people can live happy, productive lives from both an economic and moral perspective. Thank you for your attention. The third presenter is Keiichi Daokimura, the Faculty of Social Welfare. Helping oneself and others for the sake of maintaining good mental health. Imagine for a moment that you have spent days on end without talking to anyone. When many days have passed without any direct interaction with other people, would it feel stressful? Wouldn't you feel completely isolated as if you are all alone in the world? If this went on, for a long time. What effect do you think it would have on your mental health? The spread of COVID-19 around the world, beginning in early 2020, forced us into just such a condition. Various countries decided to respond to the crisis by imposing lockdowns in many of their towns. In Japan too, as you all know, a state of emergency was issued several times, preventing us from meeting our friends or family directly. Direct, consequently, direct interaction with others, which used to characterize our daily lives, decreased dramatically. According to research by the WHO, released in June 2021, this drastic decline in opportunities for direct interaction with others caused an increase in number of people who felt lonely or isolated. Furthermore, the research revealed that such negative emotions tended to develop into mental problems. And that many people ultimately came to take their own lives. In fact, 
a few of my friends among those who decided to take their own lives because they could not be at the strain of being isolated from society in this difficult time. We can't change the past, but looking back on their lives now fills me with regret. It makes me wonder if there, if there was something we could have done for them. If there had been someone around, if there had been someone around who they could consult with, and who, who they could share their feelings with, then my friend must be here. Without having been crushed by the loneliness, I can't help but feel this way. Of course, interacting with others is not always easy. It can even be quite troublesome. Not everyone we encounter can get along with us. But we can still prove our social value by communicating with others. There is an old saying that as far is the evidence that they are get along with each other. Having someone with whom you can argue and having direct interaction with others is extremely important for maintaining our own mental health. With this in mind, various events or opportunities were created during the past two years in order to try and keep up social contact during this pandemic. This attempt can offer some help to those in need, but it is still different from real society and it is no substitute for first-hand interaction. We humans are social animals that were influenced by our own living environment. Our interaction with others, therefore, is extremely important. In light of this, it is no surprise that a WHO research demonstrates the suicide rate has increased during this pandemic, when social distancing was imposed. You might think that preventing suicide is a rare challenge. Just controlling our minds is not an easy task. Let alone supporting someone whose mind is drafting toward death. What can we possibly do to change things? You might ask. However, it does not necessarily take great effort to help. If the tiniest approach can make a difference, your warm heart, your smile, and your caring attitudes, these can save many more minds and lives than you can imagine. Life is certainly not easy. We all struggle with various difficulties on a daily basis. We are always at risk of being driven into a corner. Therefore, we should recognize the importance of maintaining interaction with others in order to prevent suicide. It is for our own sake as well as theirs. Thank you for listening. The fourth presenter is Keisuke Saito, the Faculty of Business Administration. My dream for education for the future. Good afternoon. Today, I would like to talk about studying. Of course, I enjoy studying, but this was not always true for me. Please listen to my story. When I was in high school, I absolutely hated studying. I couldn't understand what the teacher was saying, and, in, and it seemed that even students in lower grades were smarter than me. Therefore, high school life was no fun. However, I was studying because everyone was studying. My teacher said, 
study 10 hours a day for lunch, quantity, and quality. I tried to do as I was told, but I just wasn't able to focus. As soon as I started to study, but I got sleepy, I suspected that the textbook contained sleeping pills. As a result, I couldn't pass the, universe, pass the examination for the university I want to attend. Therefore, I decided to take the exam again the following year. However, the letter did not go well either. I reflected on what went wrong. I had a lot of time to study, but there was a problem with my life rhythm. I did irregular hours while studying with a little sleep. I attended preparatory school, so but I remember always being very lazy. Another problem was that I didn't know how to study efficiently, and I didn't know how to improve my memory and concentration. As a result, I once again failed to pass my first choice university. I decided to make adjustments in my lifestyle and study for university entrance examinations again. Specifically, there are three adjustments I made. So one is to get eight of hours of sleep every night. If you don't get enough sleep, so you are more likely to have health problems in the future. Regarding studying, the ability to concentrate is to reduce and it also causes decreasing memory. The second adjustment I made is fasting. Do you know fasting? So you may wonder how fasting is related to studying. After eating, so you may feel sleepy. Eating is necessary in terms of nutrition. So you have to eat a little less concentrate on your studies. I've noticed three benefits. So improve concentration, so more willpower for studying, and improve immune system. The final practice I have adopted is 30 minutes of meditation a day. In recent years, the benefits of meditation have been scientifically proven. There are many reasons to meditate, but I have only had only one. So it's for mental strength. So I can become more stress and anxiety resistant. Today, I study business management at Rich University. I have learned how to study and focus more efficiently. Looking back on my bitter experience, I thought that there are many students who do not know how to approach their studies. I don't want those students to go through what I went through. So, the in so I'm determined to create educational service that incorporates AI to create custom curriculum to match it, the need and learning style of each student. Furthermore, I want to incorporate lifestyle advice in the study program to help optimize each student's potential. There is so one more reason, so I want to help students study more efficiently. I want students to have fuller and more balanced school lives. One of my biggest regrets is the only memory of being a student, playing soccer and struggling with my studies. So I wish I could have taken on other challenges and build relationships with more people. Education should not be just about studying all the time. It has been a long journey, but today, so my university life is fun and fulfilling. So there are many things I still need to study, but I'm determined to achieve my goal of helping others, learn the joy of studying, and then reach their lives. Thank you for listening. The fifth 
Mu Zeta is his gut shot, the faculty of psychology. Do you know social anxiety disorder? How are you on? Do you know that there are some people in the world who are overly concerned about how they are perceived by others and are so afraid of embarrassing themselves that they avoid public appearances and social situations? In psychology, this condition is called social anxiety disorder. Why do people with social anxiety disorder get nervous and panic? It's because they worry too much about their behavioral mistakes or they feel that, they, that people are always watching them and they are afraid that they might have done something wrong. People with social anxiety disorder are very concerned about negative feedback from others. We've all experienced the discomfort of attending a party where you don't know anyone or the nervousness and anxiety of presenting something in front of crowd. However, people with social anxiety disorder are also experienced physical symptoms such as loss of voice, shaking of wings, dizziness, heart palpitations, or nausea. They know it is strange to feel feel like that, but it is difficult for them to suppress these feelings. In addition, in order to avoid such strong anxiety, or because they don't want people to think they are weird, they start to avoid contacting people or going out in public, which interferes with their daily life. Even after all this talk, you still might not be convinced that social anxiety disorder really exists. Therefore, I would like to talk about some other demonstrations that social anxiety disorder gets very strong anxiety. When they go out alone, for example, when they are shopping at the supermarket, they I'm sorry, they often become filled with their with anxiety and their limbs start shaking. This is because they think they they are the center of other people's attention and they are careful not to do anything wrong. These feelings generally make them more nervous. Think about your own experience. If you see someone you know in the nearby heart, nearby parks or on your way home, for example, someone you are in the same class with but don't get along with, or someone you have only met a few times in the neighborhood, how would you react? Would you say hello to them? People with social anxiety disorder might pretend to be focused on their phone and ignore the person as if they weren't looking, even though they may just keep opening and closing their phone. The first reason for this is that they are not comfortable talking to you unless you are very close to them. The second reason is if you say hello to them, they may not respond or they may not recognize you, which, in, which makes them think twice. In addition, with the spread of smartphones, people nowadays frequently use social networking services rather than talking in real life. We often see high school students wearing the same uniform on the train, sitting next to each other but not talking to each other, completely engrossed in their cell phones. As such, decreases in opportunities to interact with others may have led to an increase in social anxiety disorder. The reason I know so much about social anxiety disorder is partly because I learned about it in my psychology class. But one of the most important is because I also have social anxiety disorder myself. Although it doesn't interfere terribly much with my life, 
I get very nervous about going out alone and I worry about my face turning red. In fact, I was also very worried about entering this contest. So how can social anxiety disorder be overcome? It is treated with medication and psychotherapy. Psychotherapy uses cognitive behavioral therapy to correct people's negative thoughts and train them to deal to the situations that cause anxiety. Like me now, I feel really scared to present in front of people, but I consider it great progress for me just to be able to stand on this stage now and finish my talk completely. If you also have social anxiety disorder and it is bothering you, don't be afraid to face yourself and take the first step either by talking to a doctor or doing like I'm doing here and trying something that is challenging for yourself. Thank you for listening. The sixth presenter is Yang Wen Wang, the Faculty of Letters. Stay angry, stay awake. Hello everyone, I'm a student in the literature department. I would like to start my speech by introducing a book titled A Thousand Splendid Sons. Despite the title, this is not a heartwarming story, but rather it describes the hardships and trials of two girls growing up in the backdrop of war and extreme patriarchy in Afghanistan. Reading this book gave me a vivid understanding of what kind of world Afghan women live in. One of the sentences that impressed me most in the book is, like a compass needle that points north, a man's accusing finger always finds a woman. Always. After reading this book, I feel so sad and helpless for the oppressed females who live in Afghanistan. And it also made me furious how men can treat women in such a heartless, harsh way. Women have suffered from the content of patriarchy in varying degrees, not just in Afghanistan, but in every corner of the world, whether poor or rich, in times of war or peace. In the era of rapid development of thought and technology, many women have achieved their economic independence. Some of them have have worked, have worked their way to the top of their fields. At the same time, I wonder why the overall status of women still has not improved significantly in many parts of the world. As a part of my research into this issue, I also read a book titled Misogyny, which gave me a more comprehensive understanding of the plight of women. I realized it's not only a man's accusing finger that always finds a woman, but that women also engage in misogyny. As an example, there is a social phenomenon in China that most of the relationships between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law are disharmonious. When I was born, my grandma was disappointed and said many words to my mom just because I was not a boy. When I first heard about this episode of my birth from my mother, it really didn't seem like a big deal to, to me at the time. I could understand how my grandmother wanted a grandson because of the one-child policy. However, now having an understanding of the concept of misogyny, I feel both sadness and anger, and this episode is no longer just a story. It has much deeper meanings for me. And through this experience, I realized what a terrible thing it is to not only suffer sexual discrimination, but also regard it as a normal occurrence. Although science has pointed out the mechanism of children's genders, mothers-in-law still psychologically torment their daughters-in-law with words of disappointment and blame. They completely ignore the fact that they are also female, the same as their daughters-in-law. Therefore, 
Despite the strides women have made, I think one of the reasons that the status of women has has still not significantly improved in so many years is because women continue to be straight with women. In other words, women can be their own worst enemy. In my home country of China, competition and friction among women is attracting more and more attention in recent years. Women compete with each other in order to be recognized by the patriarchal society. So women have more appearance and body anxiety than men. Women have to take care of their children and husbands at home and play an accessory role outside. Women need to study but cannot be too smart. These beliefs are ingrained in Chinese society, so it's not a situation that can be resolved overnight. Fortunately, growing numbers of girls are coming to understand these traps of patriarchy and are fighting back. Real known successful women no longer afraid of the label of the of no longer afraid the label of feminist and have begun to speak up for the status and the freedom of women in public. Moreover, young female teachers also pay attention to the to, to the equal to the eco equal education. For instance, clever is no longer a word just used for boys. Girls can also be praised in this way instead of being described as hardworking. Patriarchal society wants women to be like the moon. With the sun has set, it can emit a gentle light. But as long as the sun is out, it cannot be seen. So the moon is always hidden by the powerful sun. But the book I introduced to you at the beginning of this speech, A Thousand Splendid Suns, it describes women not as moon, but as being one thousand suns. This title reached deeply into myself. Like a powerful sun, no matter what they have been through, women should follow their inner selves, choose their own path, be who they want to be and believe in their self-worth. In a now famous college commitment speech, Apple founder Steve Jobs told young people to stay hungry, stay foolish. For the girls, I say, stay angry. Stay awake. Thank you for your attention. The seventh presenter is Ko Ezu Miyazaki, the Faculty of Economics. What are you passionate about? Do you have a clear dream? Do you have passion? This speech is about both of those things. Our time as a student will end in a few years and then we'll start our journey to make our dreams come true. However, some of my friends are not clear about their dreams or they hide their dreams for fear of failure. So today, I want to dedicate this speech to my friends and other people like them. This is my suggestion. To make your dream clear, ask yourself what it is you're really passionate about. There is no doubt that our passion is the fuel for the fire of our action. In other words, our passion is the essence of our life experiences the thing that gives us the deepest sense of fulfillment. And I believe all of us have past experiences we were passionate about. There are experiences from which we can draw from passionate past experiences that will help us clarify our future dreams. As for me, well, let me tell, my, let me tell you my story. When I was in high school, I was a captain of my tennis club. There were 63 members in the club, and leading such a big group wasn't all easy for me. They all had different ways of thinking and different, different 
ideas for the club. So I got to know each and every teammate and never gave up supporting them for a whole year. And before my retirement, I could unite us as a cohesive team. This success came from my passion for tennis and love and respect I had my teammates. When you listen to my story, it might seem that I was passionate about bringing the tennis club members together. And you might think that my dream would be to start a tennis club on my own. Right? But it was not. We wanted to win the team competition, so we knew we needed to build a cohesive team. So let me ask you two important questions. You can make your own dream much clearer. The first question is, if you, can, or if you had all the time and money in the world, what would you spend your time and money doing? The second question is, what is your hat? Oh, sorry. The second question is, what is your happy or gives you the deepest sense of fulfillment? Answering those two questions made it clear to me that A. I'm happy if I'm needed by someone and B. I'm happy if I can solve someone else's problem and make them happy. And I want to turn those dreams into the essence of my career. To be specific, I want to solve the poverty problem in Japan. I think that one of, one of the solutions to domestic poverty is to spread investment education. In fact, that's why I decided to enter, enter the Department of Economics here at Risho. Although it is unclear now whether I should be a school teacher or a financial institution, I strongly believe it that by inclusive investment knowledge of all Japanese people. I might have solved the poverty problem here in Japan. And I think that everyone in the world, including Japanese people, should have equal rights to receive the fi same financial education as people do in the United Kingdom and the United States. I believe that if we can eliminate even a little bit of anxiety, uh, and anxiety about money. We will have more freedom and courage to pursue our dream and passions. So I want the people know that there are other ways to make money besides just working. This is why I'm passionate about my dream. However, I know that every passion cannot become a career and even though we may love and enjoy what we do, if nobody wants to pay for the products of our passion, it cannot become our career. Therefore, we must combine the skills and talents we have along with the current market trends. But most importantly, we shouldn't take a routine jobs that we have no passion for. For example, people like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs, their dream was not to be a rich. They were simply eager to make their dreams come true. And because we've been watching such passionate people and hearing their stories, we know the power of passion and we, it can create. So please ask yourself those two questions to find your passion and your dreams end, and then find your ideal career. Again, to recap. recap. First question, if you had all the time and money in the world, what would you spend your time and money doing? The second question, what, you, what makes you happy or gives you the deepest sense of fulfillment? Only you can answer those two, those, these, question, these questions. Thank you very much. And last but not least, the eighth presenter is Takahiro Osuda, the Faculty of Data Science. Every piece of data 
the potential of dead science. What would you say if I told you that your everyday life could bring about the revolution? Most of you would probably reply, no way! However, our, our daily lives contain inconceivable amounts of data. For instance, think about this. Do you remember what you do every day? How about all your meal for the past week and where you bought the ingredients? Once we start to think like this, we see that the number of decisions we make every day is endless. Even though we are constantly making decisions, we tend to forget the most of them as time goes by. What is the point, you might wonder, of trying to remember such things? After all, it has nothing to do with the future. What though if each and every action in our daily lives could change society in the future? That could unlock all sorts of possibilities and that is precisely the power shift in data science. What do you imagine when you hear the term data science? When I asked my family and friends this question, I received a lot of replies like, what is that all about? Or it sounds complicated. That tends to be the majority perception. It seems to be a bit difficult to imagine what data science can offer our society. I think part of the problem is that people misunderstand the term data. It is easy to think of data science based on collecting amounts of detailed information as a word composed just of numbers, but that is a mistake. Data encompasses everything from the things we eat and buy to every word entering a search engine. And however small and insignificant they may seem, each piece of data shines like a small diamond making up a big wine. Each has its own shape and shine, and by combining all those little diamonds in different ways, a world you could never previously imagine spreads before you. For example, a taxi company developed a system that predicts demand by combining usage records with public data, such as real-time location information, and data about the weather, facilities, and the events. Another example is estimating real estate prices by combining, by, sorry, by combining public data such as railway zone prices, census data, information about the housing quality and land statistics, and so forth. These are just some of the ways that data can create a new value or help achieve our ask goal. With widespread networks and demand generated, ev generated from every situation, there is no denying the potential of data to transform society. Inspired by such cases, I argue that data science can not only enrich people's lives, but also reveal to them the incredible possibilities of data. However, the body of data often remains unrecognized by society. For example, I tried to negotiate with a sports team to see if I could collect sprinting data in order to help maximize the team's performance. However, I was unsuccessful. While the coach appreciated my proposal, he showed little interest in the data itself. Some people are simply uninterested in data and it is difficult to change their minds. Why do people think this way? Some might argue that it is because data science is still too new. However, I think the most fundamental reason is not its newness, nor its context, but rather the technical challenges involved in cases utilizing data science. Currently, Special software and advanced knowledge and skills tend to be required to collect reliable data. 
These hurdles keep people from utilizing data in their life and work. It is not easy to overcome such difficulties since it is not always technology but people's assumptions, people's assumptions that create them. By working through all such hurdles, however, we data scientists not only enrich we, we did science can help people to enrich their lives in new ways. Data science will be essential to our lives from now on. The world has become connected via the internet, and we are exposed to, exposed to information constantly, whether we like it or not. We might sometimes feel overwhelmed by it, but Making good use of data offers us a future of limitless potential. In this regard, we are living in the diamond mines. How to dig the diamonds? That is our own choice. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Emma, for your speech today. Well done. これよりゲストスピーカーの大島翔人より特別講話を行っていただきます大島翔人は上智大学外国語副部を経て立正大学仏教学部をご卒業されました学生時代に中南米を留学した経験を生かして日蓮宗の国際布教師としてヨーロッパや東南アジアに7年間駐在し英語をはじめとしたあ英語をはじめとする外国語での布教活動に従事され現在は日蓮宗宗務院伝道部国会課長でいらっしゃいます本日の講話のタイトルは「言語習得の先にあるもの言葉が開く扉の向こう側」ですそれでは大島商人よろしくお願いいたしますただいまご紹介をいただきました日蓮宗修務院伝道部国際課長の大島啓二と申します本日はこのような場にゲストスピーカーとしてお招きをいただきまして誠にありがとうございます学生の皆さん審査をお待ちの間大変緊張されているかと思いますが場を和ますような話になるかどうかちょっと自信がありませんが言語学習を言語学習を皆さんに先立って行ったものの一人としてアドバイスを兼ねたちょっとしたお話を私の経験を交えながら今日はさせていただこうと思っておりますまず私が今勤めております日蓮宗の修務員というところは日蓮宗僧侶の8000人お寺が5000鍛冶屋と言われておりますけれどもそれを取りまとめる役所のような場所でございますそこの中で私は今国際課長という立場をいただきまして海外での布教活動に励んでいらっしゃる日本人の教師の方また外国出身の僧侶の方のサポートをしているという立場になります私自身もご紹介いただきました通りヨーロッパまた東南アジアで7年間国際布教師として布教活動に携わらせていただきまして今こうしてサポートの立場に回ってきたというような経緯でございます二次演習は現在世界12カ国30以上の拠点で布教活動を展開しておりましてもともとはアメリカやブラジルといった日系の移民の多い地域での布教活動を中心に行ってまいりましたが近年アジアですとかヨーロッパといった日本人の移民が少ない地域での布教活動ということも盛んに行われるようになりまして。えー、日本人だけでなく現地の方への布教活動というのにも今力を入れているというような
現状でございますまず私自身のお話を少しさせていただきますと実は私はご紹介をいただきました通り皆さんの先輩にあたります実はこの大崎の学者で中高の6年間また大学の2年間を学ばせていただきました立正中高6年間大崎で学んだ後上智大学に進学をいたしまして外国語学部でスペイン語を専攻いたしました3年の時に1年間休学をいたしまして中南米20カ国スペイン語圏のところを全て留学をしましてその時に、えー、自分はいずれお坊さんになるという道があるのだからそろそろ決心をして、えー、大学を卒業した時には立証に編入をして2年間仏教の勉強をしようということで上智大学を卒業した後立証の仏教学部修学科で2年間仏教のことを学び日蓮宗の僧侶となりました。えー、僧侶になって、えー、10年が経ち、えー、そのうちの7年間を国際布教師として海外での布教活動を行ってまいりました私が布教に携わったのはイギリスイタリアそれからあアジアですとシンガポールとかマレーシアを中心とした東南アジアの地域での、えー、布教活動に携わらせていただきました、えー、本日はこのような場でお話をさせていただくにあたり、まあ、外国語学者に取り組んだものとしてまた立正大学の一先輩として、えー、外国語を習得した先にどんなものが待ち構えているのかということをお,お話をしたいと思っておりますまず私が上智大学に進んだ後、外国語学部に入って一番先に最初に言われたことは外国語というのはあくまでツールでしかないそのツールを使って何を行うかということをこの在学中の4年間で考え習得しないと本当に外国語を習得したことのいいというものは得られないよということを当時の学部長先生から訓示を受けたことを今でも鮮明に覚えております。この何を学ぶかということは大変大事で当時上智の外国学部の場合には各学科の中に副専攻という制度がありまして政治学や経済学あるいは歴史文学美術私の場合は言語学という分野を学びまして言葉の成り立ちあるいはそのスペイン語そのものの構造というものを、えー大学4年のうち後半2年間が中心に勉強をいたしましたこの何に使うかという答えは人それぞれです特に立正大学に今通ってらっしゃる学生の皆さんはそれぞれの学部でこれを学ぼうという強い思いを持って大学に進学をされたことと思います私の場合はただただ外国語を勉強したいという漠然とした思いで上智大学に進学をいたしましたが入って真っ先に突きつけられたのは言葉だけではなくそこから何を学ぶかを考えるというふうに言われたというのが鮮明な記,録とし記憶として私の中には残っています今私にとって外国語を習得して何を伝えるか何を学ぶかというのは当時の言語学という言葉の問題から仏教を伝えることに変わりました皆さんにとってこれからこうして英語を活用する機会をいただいたスピーチをした経験を生かして今後社会人になった時に何を伝えるかどうかというのをぜひ大学の4年間の間に考えていただきたいというふうにそしてそれを決めるため考えるための今日はヒントを2つお伝えをしたいと思いますまず1つ目は何においても自分を知るということが大切です私の経験に照らし合わせて言えば私が自分のことをよく理解したのは、えー、中南米を留学している1年間の
その留学経験というものが自分自身を見つめるきっかけになりました海外に行って生活をする中でまた外国人の学生さんと交流をする中で言葉ができないというフラストレーション自分の言いたいことをうまく伝えられないというモヤモヤした気持ちそんな気持ちを抱えることは皆さんあることだと思います私の場合はそれに加えて自分自身がこれまで経験したことのない話題が外国語で展開されているということに驚きました政治の話経済の話思想の話文化の話歴史の話それぞれの外国からやってきた学生が自分の国はこうだよこういう文化を持っているよということを確信を持って話しているのを尻目に私自身はうろ覚えの日本史の知識や日本の文化の知識を披露することがこことしかできないということにまず戸惑いを覚えましたこれは海外に行った時にあ自分自身のこと自分のルーツのことというものをいかに自分が知らなかったなということを気づかされるそんなきっかけになったということを今でも鮮明に覚えています特にホームステイ先の家族や仲のいい学生さんたちと話をするときに自分のバックグラウンドの話をすれば私はお寺の生まれでしたのでお寺の生まれとして仏教徒として仏教というのはどういうことなんだということが説明できない自分に苛立ちを覚えましたどれだけ自分のことを考えてこなかったんだろう自分のルーツというのがどこにあるかということを考えてこなかったんだろうそんな気持ちを抱えながら1年間の留学生活を送ったことを今でもよく覚えていますこの自分のアイデンティティが何なのか自分のルーツはどこにあるのかそれを見つけるのがこの大学の4年間の中で大変大事な役割を持っているということを皆さんにはぜひ認識をしていただきたいと一先輩として今日は思っておりますこの自分のアイデンティティを持つということは自分の意見をはっきりと述べるために大変大事なことです今日の皆さんの発表は科学のこと社会問題のことあるいは自分の経験に基づいたメッセージたくさんの思いが詰まっていましたそれぞれの立場それぞれの経験そういったアイデンティティがあるからこそ今日の発表ができたのではないかなと今日皆さんの発表を聞きながら思っておりましたそんな皆さんに学生の時にそういったところまで思いが至らなかった私が言うのもなんですけれどももっと深いところまであるいはこの4年間で深められるところまで自分のアイデンティティルーツというものを確認していただくそんな時間を持っていただければいいかなというふうに思っています2つ目の大事な鍵は相手のことを知ることですこれは私が国際不況の現場で体験したことを少しお話をしながら説明をさせていただきます個人個人、えー、それぞれ歩んできた道思想の背景というもの文化の背景というものは違いますけれどもそれ以上に国と国との間の考え方の違い、習慣の違いという壁は大変大きなものがあります。私はイギリス、イタリア、東南アジアといった全く考え方も文化も違う国で布教活動にそれぞれ携わる中で、一つ例を挙げれば、例えばイギリス人は、まあ、島国の人ですので、非常に心を開くまでに時間がかかる。そんな印象を持っていますその一方で大変気まじめで熱心な方が多いのがイギリスの国民性です一方イタリアは、まあ、いわゆるラテン系の文化ですので大変熱しやすくその一方で冷めやすいそういった人たちをどうやってお寺にとどま,とどまらせることができるかということをいつも苦慮していました
東南アジアは大変面白い場所でお寺に来られる方は大半の方が華僑中国,中国系の移民の方でしたしかし国の中を見,ます見回すとマレー系の方インド系の方またシンガポールであれば白人の方日本系の方多くの人種がその中にいるそんな中で民族背景というものがそれぞれの人種にとって強いアイデンティティを残してどのように自分の思いを伝えるかということはそれぞれ相手の様子を見ながら決めていかなければならなかったという経験を7年間の国際フトの活動の中で行いました仏教には対比説法という言葉があります対比というのは相手の能力に合わせて説法をする教えを説かなければならないということがお釈迦様に教えの中にも残っています自分の言いたいことを伝えるそのためにはまずは相手のことをよく知ることがとても大事です今日皆さんのスピーチを聞いていて大変スピーチとして洗練されたスピーチあるいは短い文ではあるけれどもよく要点を捉えて相手に伝わるスピーチさまざまなスピーチが展開されていたなという印象を受けましたこれは皆さんがどんな方に向けてメッセージを発信しているかそれぞれの思っている思い描いているイメージが違ったのではないかなと個人的には思っていますどれだけ英語力が洗練されていってもそのメッセージを受ける相手がどんな人なのかということを常に思い描かなければ皆さんの伝えたいことはもしかすると伝わらないかもしれませんこれは私が東南アジアで経験したことですけれどもイギリスを経てまた東南アジアでも何年も活動して英語で法話を行ってきましたがその中で自分はこれだけ英語ができるから難しい文章でお話をしても伝わらないことがよくありますなぜならば相手も第一言語として英語を話しているわけではないそんな方もたくさんいますのでそういった相手に対しては逆に短い文章で簡単なボキャブラリーを使ってお伝えをするということも大事なんだなということを国際不況の現場で学びましたスペイン語の他にイタリア語もイタリアに2年おりましたので習得しましたがちゃんと学校には通わず独学でなんとか法話ができるぐらいまでのボキャブラリーを獲得して小難しい話はできない何度も何度も同じ単語を繰り返してしまうそれでもどこが要点なのかということをしっかり相手の状況を理解し相手の目を見てお伝えをするということがいかに大事かと。いうことをイタリアでの経験では学びました私たちにとって相手のことをよく知るために何が必要かそれは相手が何を大事にしているかそれを知ることがとても大事です今日皆さんの主張の中で論点がそれぞれありましたおそらく私がこれから皆さんともしお話しする機会があればそれぞれの論点の中でメッセージがどこにあったのかということを考えながらお話をすることになると思います相手の大事を知ってその人が何を大切にしているかどういった思考を持っているのかということを理解することそれが自分の伝えたいことを伝えるためにとても大事なことであるということをどうか覚えておいていただきたいと思います今回、えー、こうしてゲストスピーカーとしてお話をさせていただくときにお打ち合わせをさせていただきましてその中でぜひ立正大学の見学の精神に触れていただきたいというリクエストをいただきました私の中でお話を作っていて今日お話しした今の2点というのはある意味立正大学の見学の精神に通ずるものがあるのではないかなと思っておりま,すまず、え
真実を求めるということ、真実を求め、姿勢を捧げようという部分、真実を求めるということは、自分自身のアイデンティティ、自分が大切にしていることは何なのかということを探ること、それがまず1点だと思います。2点目、正義をたっとび、邪悪を除こう。正義というのは、相手が大切にしているもののことです。それを尊重すること、それこそが、他の人のアイデンティティを大切にすることそして3つ目和平を願い人類に尽くそうこの自分自身の大切を相手に伝えることそして相手の大切なことを尊重することこの2つが絡み合って初めて和平この世界の平和というものが実現できるというのがこの立正大学の見学の精神ですこの立正大学の見学の精神は一連衆の宗祖一連商人の皆目章というお手紙の中に我日本の柱とならん我日本の眼目目とならん我日本の大戦大きな船とならんという言葉がありそれを石橋丹山学長さんが現代風に解釈をされたのがこの見学の精神だというふうに伺っております現代においても相手を理解することまた自分の大事なことをお伝えをすることそれがとても大事でありその中で他の人とのハーモニーが生まれるということがこの言葉には表れているんではないかなというふうに今回お話を考えながら感じておりましたでは、外国語を習得したその先に一体何があるんでしょうか先ほどもお伝えしました通り、言葉というのはあくまでアウトプットをするためのツールでしかありません。その道具をどのように使うかということを皆さんはこれから学んでいかなければならない。社会に出て学ぶこともあるでしょう。また学生生活の中で様々な経験を通して学ぶこともあるかと思います外国語を習得したその先に誰に何を伝えるかということが大切になるということをどうか覚えておいてくださいこの誰に何を伝えるかということは外国語に限らず日本語でも同じことだと思いますまず誰にというのは先ほどの話の中で2点目に挙げました相手のことを知ることそして何をという部分は自分自身を知ること自分自身の意見自分の考えどうやったらそれを伝えることができるのか要点はどこにあるのかそれを考えることが自分を知ることですこれから社会に出ていく皆さんにとって大学の4年間というのはかけがえのない時間ですそれは大学中には気づかないかもしれませんが社会に出た後で大事な4年間だったなと振り返った時にそう思える4年間であればいいなというふうに一先輩として思います大学の4年間は客観的に自分の人生を見るその経験ができたかどうかということが大事です私の場合どの時点で振り返ってみても例えば中学生高校生大学生社会人になってからどの時点を振り返ってもその時点で何かしらの学びがありその学びがその先である成果につながっているというふうに私自身は分析をしていますそれはその時にはこうした経験が身を結ぶということはわからないと思いますでも一生懸命今この4年間を過ごすことで初めて将来それが果実として実をなすということをどうか覚えておいてくださいこの立正大学の学生として皆さんはアイデンティティを確立できているでしょうか私は大学を2つ通って上智大学でキリスト教の精神を学
りまた立正大学で仏教の精神を学びました海外に出てみるとこの宗教観というのは一つの柱として大きな役割を持っていますですがなかなか大学に在学していてもそういった宗教観に触れる機会は少ないのかなと個人的には思っていますせっかくの機会ですのでどうか学びの一つとして仏教の考え方に触れてみる機会を持ってみてくださいそれを自分の柱とするかどうかは皆さん次第です宗教という言葉は胸の教えと書きますが自分自身の柱になる考え方が宗教であるというふうに、えー、一宗教家として思っていますその中心になる教えは何でも構いませんキリスト教でもいいですイスラム教でも結構です仏教でもいいです神道でもいいですあるいは政治的思想でも構わないと思いますですが何か一つ芯を持って考え方ができるかどうかということがこれから社会に出ていった時またもし英語を使って仕事をしたいと思うのであれば世界に出ていった時に大切になるということをどうか覚えておいてくださいこのアイデンティティの根幹になるものを確立することができるかどうかそれが大学4年間の意義がどれだけ大きかったかということを将来決めることになるのではないかなと。私は自分の経験の中で思いましたですのでこうして一先輩としてお話をさせていただく今日皆さんには残り何年間かちょっと私存じ上げませんけどもそれぞれ残された時間の中で立正大学に通った学生として4年間恥ずかしくない誇らしい時間が過ごせたということを言っていただけるように。自分のアイデンティティを4年間の間に確立していただきたいそんなことを思いまして今日のゲストスピーカーとしてのお話とさせていただきたいと思います皆さん審査結果ドキドキだと思います私も、えー、見ていてどなたになるか全然わかりません<笑>ですので結果楽しみにしておりますでもどんな結果になってもこの経験をしたということが皆さんの人生にとって大きな意味を持つと思います。結果を気にせず、まあ、気にはなると思いますけれども、気にせずに、えー、今日こうして英語でスピーチをできたということを一生の応援したいただきたいなと思っております。どうもご清聴ありがとうございました。それではお時間になりましたのでコンテストを再開いたします。We will now begin the awards ceremony.First, Center Director Dendo will give a brief comment about the speeches.Okay, before we announce the results, I'd like to make some comments about today's speeches.First, I'd like to say that I'm glad I'm not a judge. It was very, very difficult to determine today's winners. And as I mentioned earlier,、uh, this is a contest, so we have to choose winners. However, there are no losers in an event like this. This was an opportunity for personal growth and exploring one's possibilities. So, in that sense, all of you are winners. All of you had important messages, and I commend you for seizing this opportunity and make, making your voice heard. Making an effective speech is one of the most difficult things to undertake, but it is also one of the most rewarding. Your preparation and hard work were evident throughout your performance, and listening to you speak so passionately on a topic or issue. You really truly care about was deeply moving. As Vice President Suda said earlier, communication comes from speaking passionately from your heart. Your speeches of turning failure into triumph, overcoming difficult hurdles, 
wanting to improve the lives of others, and spreading awareness of important issues were truly inspiring. You embody the racial spirit of expert times moralist. Be very proud of your achievement and remember this moment. Build on this experience and continue to make your voices heard as you go through life. Congratulations to all of you on a job well done. Now, we'll move on to the contest results. First, Mr. Alexander Hunter will announce the third place winner. <clears throat> the third place winner for this year's Risho Voices Speech Contest is Keichiro Kimura for his speech titled Helping Oneself and Others for the Sake of Maintaining Good Mental Health. He will receive a certificate, a trophy, and a prize of 30,000 yen. Congratulations. And regarding your speech, um, it is a topic that has been more prevalent in the news recently, and I think many people are becoming more aware of the importance of human interaction on our mental health. And I thought it was very brave that you were able to come to the stage having first-hand personal experience of loss and being able to express that to everybody and being emotionally open and vulnerable. So that was very impressive. And the thing I think that stood out to me the most was the fact that even small gestures like a smile or saying hello to somebody can have a big impact on their day, especially if it's somebody who isn't doing well emotionally at that time. And it can give them a complete 180. So I thought that was a very beautiful thought and something that I think I'll remember going forward. So, congratulations, and if you would please come here and say a few words. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to everyone um, who supported, supported me. Thank you very much. Gary Dando and Alexander Hunter will now make Arrow's presentation. Risho University Certificate of Commendation. Third place. This certificate is awarded to Keiichiro Kimura in recognition of final round participation and excellence in the second Risho Voices Speech Contest held on November 13, 2021. President, Risho University, Hiroshi Yoshikawa. Director, Center for International Exchange, Gary Dendo. Great job. Congratulations. Next, Professor Medrano will announce the second place winner. <laughs> the second place winner of this year's Risho Voice Contest is Mr. Takahiro Masuda. 
His speech was entitled, Every Piece a Diamond, The Potential of Data Science. He will receive a certificate and trophy and a prize of 50,000 yen. Congratulations. Yep. So, Mr. Matuda, data science is relatively a new field, and many people are still very uncomfortable about talking about it, even just as you said about your coach. Uh, they are just quite uh, uncomfortable talking about science, and yet, you were able to inspire interest or ignite interest in this particular uh, field just through your speech. And just as diamonds are supposed to be valued and protected, so is our data to be valued and protected. And I hope that I think it was a very brilliant idea to liken data science to a piece of diamond. Who would have thought, you know? And yet, uh, a piece of diamond is also to be valued and protected. Well, I hope the world will find out more about data science, and I wish you all the best in your data science field. Perhaps someday, you are going to stand in front of the whole world accepting a speech in the Nobel Peace Prize about data science. That is going to be your biggest diamond. Congratulations again. indeed to all the participants. I was very much impressed with the enthusiastic speeches on various topics. For example, food loss, business and political problems, COVID-19 related issues, future planning, SAD, uh, discrimination, and so on. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute to your efforts. And 
The first prize winner, so-called gold medalist of the Lichio contest, Lichio Voices 2021, is from the Faculty of Letters, Ms. Yang Wong. I'm very sorry. Uh, Yang, Yang Wen Wang. Please come this way. Uh, as we all know, uh, her speech is quite fluent. In a nutshell, her speech is up to date well organized and very persuasive, very splendid. Congratulations on winning the first prize. Thank you. Uh, this is my first time to participate in a speech contest, uh, and this really made me very nervous. And it's such an honor to have this award because all the presentations here are really incredible. And the last thing I want to say is I really want to say thank you to Professor Dendo who helped me a lot in my speech. And also the friends that over there, they said fighting for me even in Chinese before I do this speech and this gave me a lot of power. And also, I want to thank to the Kokusai Kodio Senta and the teachers who come to here today, and all of you made this uh, incredible, unforgettable day in my life. Thank you very much. Jerry Dendo and Professor Uno will now make the arrows presentation. We show university. Certificate of Commendation, first place. This certificate is awarded to Yang Wen Hong, one, in a recognition of final round participation and excellence in the second We Show Voices speech contest. Center Director Dendo will now make, make closing remarks. Thank you. Our fourth to eighth place participants will all receive a certificate of participation and a prize of 10,000 yen. Congratulations again for reaching the final round and giving fine performance. On behalf of the Center for International Exchange, I would like to thank all the people who supported this event. First of all, I would like to express my appreciation to not only the eight students here today, but to all the students who submitted entries. Without you, there would be no contest. 
I sincerely hope we'll see you again next year. I would also like to expand, extend special thanks to all the Risho instructors who worked behind the scenes coaching the participants. Your efforts are deeply appreciated. Next, I would like to thank our judges, Professor Uno, Professor Madrano, and Mr. Alexander, no, excuse me, Mr. Hunter. Judging a speech contest is not an easy task, and especially today. The quality, uh, the quality and the content of the speeches were extremely high, and they had to make some very difficult choices today. I would also like to thank Risho University instructor, Mr. Shingo Ito, for judging the preliminary round. Finally, our appreciation to Reverend Oshima for his motivating talk on the fruits of learning foreign languages. Your talk provided a bountiful harvest of insight and information. Thank you so much. And that will conclude our contest for this year. Thank you everyone for your participation and attention today. And let's make a date to meet again next year. Everyone take care and see you next year. Thank you.